بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين إنه خير ناصر ومعين ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين من ليلتنا هذه إلى قيام يوم الدين السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين صلوا على محمد وآل محمد Sisters, brothers in Islam and Iman, Salaamun Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. The topic that we're discussing is the stages of life or the highlights of worldly life as explained in the Quran. And before we continue um, explaining and going on to stage number two, I want to recap what we talked about last night. Um, just as a reminder uh, for us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his book of wisdom and guidance has placed a lot of wisdom and guidance for us and among the surahs which contain profound messages is one surah known as Surah Al-Hadid surah number 57 and this surah is one of those surahs um, for which it's been mentioned in a hadith that somebody who regularly recites this before going to sleep, that person will not die um, except he or she will meet the Imam of the time. And if he happens to die or she happens to die before they meet the Imam of the time, then they will be in the company of the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Now, we said yesterday that there has to be something in this surah which is connected to making the reciter of it somebody who is prepared to be with the Imam. Being with the Imam of the time, joining the Imam is a mission, in his mission is not a roll of the dice where, oh, if only he chooses me when he comes. No, the Imam Islam has instructions for us already. Right? There's things that he's expecting from us already, right here and now. And it's upon us um, because of that intense desire we have to be with the Imam of our time to start working on that from now and readying ourselves and preparing ourselves so that when he does come it's natural that we will be selected among those who would be his companions so there has to be something in this surah when you look at this surah there's a lot of profound messages um, one of them uh, has to do with how the surah explains the life of this world 
In this one verse, which is verse number 20, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> mentions that the life of this world is contained in five highlights, or there's five aspects to it. There's five prominent stages to life. And as we explain, some of the scholars have, have deduced that the order that's mentioned in this verse of these five stages is important because it corresponds to the order and the stages of development of a human being as they go through their worldly life. What are those five stages? A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-jim I'alamu annama al-hayatu dunya la'ibun wa lahwun wa zinatun wa tafakhrun baynakum wa takathurun fil amwali wal awlad Know that life the worldly life consists of these five things. La'ib, which is play or amusement. Wa lahu, lahu is diversion. Wa um, zina, zina is ornament. And then the fourth one was tafakhrun baynukum, uh, meaning that mutual rival, rivalry. Wa takathrun fil amwali wal awlad, and accumulating more um, children and more wealth. So, what we need to do is understand, you know, what is the message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to send us here? Allah who created us, Allah who tells us about what's going to happen, what's about the hereafter and what lies beyond this planet earth and this material world, also created the planet earth as well too. And He created our time in this world as well. And so He, in His wisdom, is telling us about our life when it comes to other things as well too. Quran. And Islam is not just about the hereafter, it's about this world as well too. So this verse is extremely interesting uh, because it's talking about our day-to-day -day lives and what we aspire towards and what we um, strive for and what it, what it is that really captures our attention when it comes to our worldly life. Now, so that, that's the, now that concludes the summary of yesterday, although of course if you were paying attention, you might have gotten some new points as well too that were kind of slid in um, during that summary. But now we're going to talk about new things. New point number one is that not everyone necessarily follows the same pattern. That everyone kind of goes through and this is their highlight in their life when it comes to um, their worldly experience. No, this is saying the general pattern of human beings is such. And I think that if those of you, um, like myself, who have aged now, and you've kind of been through things and seen some different things, right? Like got into the whole um, marriage and then uh, ch uh, children rearing uh, stage of your life. You'll see, it, you'll see that, you know, um, you, you, you yourself will know at a level of your own conscience that, you know what? This verse is speaking truth and it definitely corresponds to um, what happens with a human being as they go through life. But it may be the case that for somebody, this is, pattern doesn't work for them. That doesn't mean that the verse is batil, na'udhu billah or that it's not valid. No, it's talking about the general pattern. Some people, it may be different. They might um, not be interested in, let's say, um, ornamentation, but they might be interested in just gaining money. Or for some people, they might just be stuck at stage number one. They're still playing with toys and they haven't gone past that. Okay, now, um, we talked yesterday about the first stage, which was la'ib, play. La'ib in Arabic, and means anything that you do. Now this is important because we need to contrast this with lahu, right? We kind of didn't d draw the distinction between them yesterday. Laib in, in the Arabic language, according to the um, those who who you know write lexicons and were uh, lexicographers, lexicographers, they say that laib is any action that you do um, that either does not have any goal or purpose behind it. You're just doing it, just like that. Or it's something that has a purpose, but that purpose is something which is imaginary. It's just fake. Right? You know how when you, when you play a game, right, you're, you're, you have this sort of story that you set up. There's a storyline behind the game. It's not true. It's not, it doesn't have any uh, bearing in reality. But while you're playing that game, you assume that that's your goal and you need to do this. Okay, you need to break, you need to find that golden key so you can unlock the cage and then, you know, I don't know, the princess Zelda can come out. Right? So that, who, who's Princess Zelda? Like, I mean, she doesn't, does she exist out in the real world? No. So it's something, it's a completely imaginary, um, it's a bogus goal, but you're engaged with it. Now, lahu, which is, inshallah, tonight our goal is to cover the second and third stages. 
Lahu is something which is a diversion. Uh, what, in, more precisely, it's something which diverts you from that which ought to be important for you. Okay? So, what's the difference between Lahu and Laib? A lot of times they're the same thing. Right? Somebody who's always playing games, instead of working on their work, what they should be serious about, um, that game for them um, is something that could become a diversion as well too because they have their goal and they're not working towards their goal. But it's not always the case. Sometimes you can have something which is a, which is a, di a diversion but uh, it's, not, it's not something which is um, a play, not something which is a game. For example, for example, all right, you have something really important that you need to work on for school. Like let's say you have to write a paper. All right. Now you sit down to start writing this paper and you know you write your, I don't know, what do they call it? The thesis statement or that thesis, right? So you write down your thesis statement. And you're like, oh wow, okay, I, wrote, I got my thesis done. I'm, I'm making some progress. And then you hit alt tab and then you, you, and then you go check you know, email and then you go check okay, Facebook and then you go back, write a few more words and then you go back and check, I don't know, this thing and that thing. You know, write a few comments, check your phone, right? Okay, when you're checking email or checking Facebook or these type of things, they're not, you're not playing around, right? You might actually say, oh, I have some serious business to work on. Um, but it, it is a diversion for you. Because here you're supposed to be working on this goal, which is writing that paper, but instead you're being diverted by these other things. So you can have something um, which is a diversion, but it's not um, play. Okay, now, this verse is talking about the second um, highlight of life, which is diversion. And what the scholars who have commented on these verses say is that a human being, um, when, uh, a, a, when somebody is like a baby or a young child, they're into playing. And that's sort of like their, their highlight. That's sort of what they look forward to. That's the most they can get, the most they can squeeze out of their worldly life, is play. But they get to a certain stage where their curi curiosity um, is now a little bit peaked, right? They're, they're curious and they want to start exploring. So for, for that child, now it's more than just play. It's play, but along with being diverted. They go from one thing to another thing to another thing. They're curious and they're seeking out different things, jumping from here to there. And um, the nature of a child at that point, as they start to get closer and closer to uh, becoming of age, but not they haven't reached there yet, is such that they're always seeking out new and interesting things. They'll play for a few minutes here, and then they'll go and play for a few minutes there. They're looking for something new to do. And just like what we said with La'ib, this is not always something which is bad. Okay, the Quran is not coming here and saying that any type of diversion is something which is bad. No, you have to only do one thing. You are only allowed to play with one toy in this house for today. No, that's not the that's not Islamic solution to it, right? You are only, only allowed to um, take, you know, one... Uh, if, you're, if you're studying this major, you can only take classes in that major. You can't take any side classes because um, that's, that's going to be diversive and you're, di you're being diverted from your goal. No, right? That's not, that's not the Islamic perspective on it. Um, being, wanting to seek out different things and being curious about different things and exploring um, a variety of things is something which is natural. It's something which is part of our creation. We're curious about different things and that's something which should be encouraged. So nobody is coming and saying that that's something which is wrong. In fact, if we see that our children um, are, are keen on doing different things and um, they want to, for example, like engage in, in our arts and crafts and sports and whatever it is, um, that's good. It's a good use of time, especially when they're young, um, to expose them to different things so they can get that experience and learn from them. Right? This learning is not always just about uh, um, math and science and, I don't know, like the English grammar and whatever traditional subjects that are there. A, a lot of learning um, can be done in other ways. And something that we realized throughout the years is that the American education system um, although it has its positive points, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. A lot of learning um, cannot be assessed by the way the situation, by the way the system is currently constructed. So for example, if you have 
uh, somebody who's interested in doing debate or interested in doing um, I don't know, they have different sort of things in different schools, but let's say problem solving or these other types of things where they actually have to use their brain and think, that can be something which is very positive for the child. But of course, when it comes to these different uh, pursuits, whether it be arts or whether it be science, or whether it be uh, clubs or debate or whatever it is, um, in all these things we have to make sure that we are keeping in mind the guidelines that we have from the Sharia and we shouldn't um, exceed and go beyond the boundaries and put our, just for the sake of allowing them to explore and um, you know, become well-rounded, we end up uh, promoting and, and encouraging them to do something which is haram. Please say salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is, when He talks about the dunya and the highlight of the dunya being something which is lahu, He's also giving us a warning as well. Too. He's saying that this is something which is part of our nature, that at one time we'll be, we'll be attracted towards this, but he's also giving us a warning as well too. What is the warning? The warning is that, look it, um, you, we do have a goal. We said lahu is something which distracts us from our goal. We do have a goal that we should be pursuing. Let, us, let it not be the case that we're always being distracted from pursuing our goal, and at the end of the day, we haven't gotten anywhere towards it. Okay? So it's a, very, it's a very important thing to keep in mind here. It's a warning for us. And maybe perhaps we can switch off the heat. I think that now that people are getting a little bit into it, alhamdulillah, the temperature has risen. We turn up. Okay, thank you. Salaamu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So what happens? What happens is that, for example, we... Um, have something which we ought to be pursuing in our lives. Okay, Wh when, at, according to Islamic teachings, at the age of, after somebody passes the age of seven, they now to need to be uh, trained and focused on doing tasks. And the, tr the parents need to be training them so that they become responsible individuals. And we, if we're, whether, whatever age we're at, right, we have to understand that we have a certain responsibility in front of us. Right? How long are we just going to be children and not being serious about what we're supposed to be serious about? One example that we find is sometimes um, you have children or now youth or actually adults who still haven't figured out how to be responsible about um, their own education and working towards um, establishing themselves and working towards a career, whatever that career may be. I don't mean just traditional careers that we think about. But they don't have any plan for themselves in their life when it comes to managing their worldly affairs. Now you might say here that, okay, Brother Salim, why are you talking about um, careers and, and managing our time and having a plan? Um, shouldn't we just be talking about the hereafter? No, this is something which is part of Islam. Something, Islam calls us to be people who are responsible. One of our values is that we, are, we have responsibility and that we should be pursuing that as well too. Not that we're slacking off, not that we're just kind of doing one thing one day and being diverted by another thing the other day and we're just kind of jumping from one thing to another thing and not really making any progress in life. One time the Prophet was asked Sallallahu Alaihi wa Who is the one who is most beloved to Allah? Who is the one who is most beloved to Allah? The Prophet answers, he says, the one who is most useful to the people. The one who has, is doing something, has a plan, has a purpose. He or she has figured out how they're going to be useful to the people. Now, that should not be misinterpreted, that we give up everything for the people and we forget about ourselves. No, we cannot help other people unless we've taken care of ourselves. So let's not get that wrong. That we just sacrifice ourselves, forget about our own worship, our own relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. The, what, we, what we should be taking from that tradition and other traditions is that we're supposed to be people who have a purpose, be moving towards it. In another hadith, the Prophet uh, gives a, a likeness, um, an example. He says that the, the, the believer, the likeness of a believer is the likeness of a honeybee. All right? what, is the like, what does a honeybee do? The honeybee, he says, Al mu'minu kan nihla ta'akulu tayyiban wa tada'u tayyiban. Alright? 
when a honeybee a honeybee doesn't go and, and suck nectar f and take its food from just anything. No, the honeybee only goes and evaluates the situation and says, okay, I'm going to pick out the most beautiful and the best flowers and trees to alight on and only from them am, am I going to suck out the nectar. Right? You compare that to a fly. A fly, on the other hand, seeks out the worst you know, the, the most stinkiest and, and dirtiest places to go and get its food from. But the honeybee is not like that. The honeybee is, plans out and thinks ahead and, and evaluates, is looking and saying, okay, this is where I'm going to spend my time. This is where I'm, I'm going to um, take from. And then after that, the result of that careful planning and selection is that it produces something which is also beautiful as well too. The same way that it takes from beauty, it also produces beauty as well too. Honey, right? So, this is something which is an example of the Prophet, it's reported in the hadith that he gives it for us as well too. We should be having goals moving towards them. It shouldn't be the case that for, we use Islam as an excuse. No, this is a system of kuffar. Um, I'm not going to get involved with uh, getting an education and working. No, you're in the system, I'm not saying that we need to be um, uh, being obsessed with it and think that this is the end all and be all of being successful and being successful is what's defined by non-Muslim standards and that whole thing, no. But we do need to have a plan and be working towards it in our lives. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. The third stage that's mentioned, or the third highlight, is that of zina. Zina, um, the g generally speaking, it means something which is attractive and something which is beautiful and something which has goodness in it and no. no um, nothing in it which is repelling. That's called a zina. And sometimes it's used in a more specific meaning, where it's used for something that is an ornament. You attach it to something else, so that, and it itself is attractive, it itself is beautiful, and you attach it to something else, so that that other thing becomes attractive beca by way of the beauty of this thing. Like, for example, a piece of jewelry, you put a necklace, a beautiful necklace, on somebody's neck. Um, the purpose is that, okay, the, the necklace is beautiful, so therefore it's going to attract someone to the person who's wearing that necklace. Right? That's what a zina is. Again, scholars say that there comes a stage in life when, um, especially when somebody becomes of age, that suddenly um, the thing which interests them and the thing which sort of drives them and the highlight of their existence becomes things related to beauty. Whether it be wanting to make themselves beautiful or whether it be wanting to seek beauty um, in the world around them. Now, all of you who are either at that age or at one time you were at that age, you can just go back and reflect um, and see what you saw and, and look, to, look back and reflect upon what you yourself felt as well too. This is something which is natural. Uh, before, somebody who would never really care about you know, whether their hair was parted on the left or on, or on the right, suddenly that becomes a big deal. And you see them, you know, buying hairspray and gel and I don't know what, right? Um, you see them before, like, it was okay if their mom cut their hair. Now, there's no way my mom is going to touch my hair, right? And that's, that's when you're talking about guys. Now, for, for, for the sisters, it's, some, it's a different situation altogether, right? Um, when it comes to hair and, and, and other things as well, too, right? Um, when it comes to seeking beauty, seeking beauty before, right, I mean, the person who was most popular was the one who could, you know, tell the best jokes and was the loudest and most, um, you know, playful and energetic. But now, um, suddenly there's another factor involved, which is the way that somebody looks and the, the physical beauty that they display. This becomes a big deal. And there's a certain stage where this becomes the fascination of a human being. Beauty and wanting to be beautiful and seeking beauty. Now, once again, inshallah, I'm, you know, all of you are, are beautiful people, people who like beauty. You might be thinking, okay, wait, are we going to say that beauty is something which is wrong? No. Um, it's not the case that Islam is against beauty and seeking beauty. So first we're going to look at the positive side of that. And then we're going to take it back and see why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is um, warning us against this. Peace say salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
is one of his names is that he is the one who is beautiful um, and he creates things which are beautiful and he creates the desire within us to be attracted towards that thing which is beautiful and we see that this is something which is part of every human being including the Ahlul Bayt the Prophet we're told in a hadith that the Prophet um, whenever he would pass by like a mirror or even like a, a a pool of water or like a bowl of water he would look inside and he would he would sort of like part his hair and make sure he was everything was was neat and before he would go out of the home uh, he would take special care to make sure that he was extra presentable and one time one of his his wives asked him she says that okay well um, why is it that you're doing this O Prophet I mean you know why do you have to worry about your looks isn't that something which is petty and maybe she's thinking that in her mind. Isn't that something which is beyond you? You should be thinking about spiritual matters. Why are you worrying about your physical appearance? So the Prophet responds to her. He says that, um, and it's it's. Uh, he says that in Allah, Allah, Allah loves um, from His servant that when he leaves um, his home to go and meet his friends. And I'm saying this in the masculine ter- uh, tense, but of course it applies to. Um, women as well too but of course with the guidelines of Sharia when, when, a, when a man leaves his home to be with his friends that he should prepare himself for them and he should look good for them so the Prophet is telling her this is what God wants me to do to like look good for meeting my friends and um, we find this is a, is a, life, is a pattern uh, that's reflected in the Ahlul Bayt all together uh, there's a hadith which is to, which reported from our eighth Imam Islam, it's reported that he said that there are three things which bring light to the eyes. Um, one of them being uh, beautiful, uh, being um, the sight of running water. The sight of running water. You know how when you go and look at a, at, at a fall, right, and or a, a river, how it sort of like gives you this sort of refreshing feeling within your soul. That's something which is isn't something. It's not random. It's something which God placed in this universe as a means of of giving us comfort and giving us um, a spiritual feeling and it can be used to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Imam is telling us that's one of the things which bring light to the eyes another thing that he mentions is greenery greenery is another thing that brings light to our eyes so the beauty of a place like um, I don't know, Yellow, uh, Yosemite or Tahoe is something that could be something which takes us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's something which the Imam would also like to experience and he would appreciate as well too and the third thing he mentions is the sight of a beautiful face which is smiling and which reminds us of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's also one of the things another sign of beauty that takes us closer to Allah and something that the Imam would appreciate as well too so we see that beauty is something which can be uh, which is no, there's nothing wrong with it it's something that it's natural to us and something which um, in fact the Imams and the Ahlul Bayt themselves used to promote they used to dress nicely they used to look nice they themselves would appreciate beauty as well too but um, there are aspects to this which we have to be careful about this verse is talking about um, the worldly life it's talking about those things which can become a highlight in the sense that they be, can become a goal in and of themselves. And this is what we have to be careful about. Peace be upon Muhammad and Muhammad. I want to take you um, briefly to another verse of the Quran, um, which talks about this concept a little bit um, more. And this is for those who are seekers of knowledge from the Quran, who are keen readers of the Quran who would like to know more about what the Qur'an has to say. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Kahf, Surah number 18, verses number um, 7 and 8 has a very beautiful example of, and, and he, he talks very beautifully about what it means for this world to be beautiful. He says in those verses, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajeem, Inna ja'alna ma ala al-ardi zinatan laha. He says that we have made everything in this world a zina. Everything in this world is a zina. What did we say a zina means? Something with this, the, the, the more uh, specific meaning of a zina is? 
an ornament, right? So everything in this world is an ornament. And we said an ornament is something which you hang on something else in order to attract people to that thing, right? So when I'm reading this verse, I have to ask myself, okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that everything, everything in this world is, that everything that's placed on this earth is an ornament. What is it an ornament for? Inna ja'alna ma ala al-ardi zinatan laha for the world itself. Okay, why did Allah make everything an ornament for the world itself? لِنَبْلُوَهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ amala. In order to test human beings as to who is the best in his or her actions. Okay, so this verse is it's conveying something deep here. Alright, what, what is the deep message from this? It's saying that, okay, human beings, be careful. Okay, this world contains beauty. It contains things which are attractive. But don't let that attraction be something which attracts you to this world and that be the end of it. Meaning that now because you were kind of, oh, this thing sort of opened up in you at a certain stage that you started becoming attracted to beautiful things, then that's where you stop. No, no, no. That's not what it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be an attraction to the world itself, but rather it's supposed to be an attraction towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is that? Why is that? What happens if we get stuck in that level? We become fascinated and obsessed with just beauty for the sake of beauty. For example, we become obsessed with people who are, attract, are attractive and um, individuals who are promoted by the society as being uh, beautiful people physically. Right? That becomes our obsession. What happens if we, if we become obsessed with like, other things which are beautiful, like wealth and cars? And we just, that becomes our only sole obsession. At the end of the day, what happens to, the, to those things? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَإِنَّا لَجَاعِلُونَ مَا عَلَيْهَا سَعِيدًا جُرُزًا like, he, says, he gives an example, he says that we're going to make everything, all these things that we placed on this earth, eventually they're going to become um, as if they didn't exist in the first place. Right? Just like you have a plant that grows, um, in winter time it becomes completely destroyed. The earth swallows up that same thing that it once had produced. This is an analogy for us, saying that be careful, all those things which right now you think are really important and really a big deal, one day they're going to disappear. And that's when you're going to die. Because when we die, all those things become separated from us. Then we have to ask ourselves, well, why was I so obsessed about these things? What did I take with me? Okay, that was just a, a, um, a brief sort of reference there um, of a deeper point, inshallah. Brothers and sisters can take that and think about that and ponder upon. Peace be upon Muhammad, Muhammad. Oh. Muhammad. Now, drawing towards a conclusion, um, how is it that beauty can be something which is negative? Number one is when it becomes something where we, for the sake of either seeking beauty or for the sake of beautifying ourselves, we cross the limit of what's halal and what's haram. Right? This is something which is so important to God. Beauty is something which is so important that in order to help us direct that in the right channels, He's come and placed a lot of rules on the ways that we are supposed to interact with it. What we can see, what we can't see. What we can wear, what we can't wear. What parts of our body we can cover in front of whom and what we, have, what we can not cover, etc. All, the, all these rules are about governing this instinct that we have within us. And if we cross that boundary, then we should know that we've fallen into the trap of the world li worldly life. Even beyond that, brothers and sisters, sometimes the pursuit of beauty can be something which becomes, something which becomes a distraction, something which takes us away from the main goal. For example, clothing. Clothing is something which is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of you know this, right? It's something which Allah mentions in the Quran. It's supposed to be something which we're supposed to be appreciative of. And if you ever think about it and ponder upon clothing, and you look at it and you say, okay, how is it that this thing is so beautifully made, Allah placed it in this earth, it's something which, which molds itself to the shape of my body. And I can wear thin clothing or thick clothing and everything is just so, what a perfect system that God has created to keep me warm and keep me cool in different situations. If we, if we start to think in that way, we can appreciate the blessing. How is it that all these thin threads came together and they stick together? Nor, if, normally when you stick things together, 
like that, eventually they're going to fall apart. But somehow all these thin threads stick together and they form this clothing which itself works as one unit. You never think about how each one of our clothing is made up of all these thin little threads. Right? Somebody who thinks about that starts to see the blessing in clothing. But it can be taken to the extreme as well too, where clothing becomes something which we um, buy and which we, we wear um, not for the sake of, of, you know, sh of, of appreciating the blessing of God, not for the sake of using something that we need, but for the sake of something um, else. For example, the sake of purely um, causing other people to be attracted to us in the wrong way. Right? There's nothing wrong with being somebody who's presentable, being somebody who's professional, but when we use this as a way of attracting others in a wrong way, that, that's, then we're stepping over the bounds. Or it becomes something that we use as a way of simply, um, of, of simply following the fashion gods and what they have set in place for us. Now, final point I'd like to make, brothers and sisters, is that this need for wanting beauty and, and also the need for looking beautiful is something which actually sometimes we tend to misdirect. Okay? God places it in us because He wants us to realize that, wait a minute, you as a human being are created for something very great, something very lofty. We are created in order to get to God. And the only way to get to God is to have that desire to want all of beauty and to become beautiful as well too, because God is all of beauty. If we want to become get close to Him, we have to become like Him. So that desire within us for beauty, we shouldn't forget about what the reason for it is, which is to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, if we look and see the, um, the teachings of Islam, somebody who is a practicing believer, and I'm not saying just they're doing the bare minimum, no. They're going a little bit beyond that, trying to be careful of themselves. As they practice the instructions of Islam, particularly those which come which, which, which talk about how we should deal with one another, how we should talk beautifully, how we should, um, how we should converse beautifully, how we should treat each other beautifully. As we hold ourselves accountable for these actions, we'll see that over time, we will become beautiful people. That's what Islam is about. There's a hadith which tells us, you know, the prophets, of course, were people who practice Islam. They were Muslims at, the, at higher degrees of, of faith, right? There's a hadith which tells us that if you look at the physical beauty of Nabi Yusuf Nabi Yusuf is somebody that everyone knows is, was, was a very beautiful person. They say, the hadith goes this, that if you were to take all the physical, the physical beauty in this universe, then half of that would belong to Nabi Yusuf and half of it would be distributed among all the other beautiful things in this universe. That's how beautiful Nabi Yusuf was. Okay, now, just imagine how much beauty he had as a person. A lot of beauty, right? There's another hadith which says that the spiritual beauty of Nabi Yusuf Islam was greater than the physical beauty of Nabi Yusuf. Okay? Islam, when practiced to its greater forms, be makes us become beautiful people. Allah Subhanahu says in the Quran, Allah will make those who practice the religion be people who are beloved in the eyes of people. People will love them, be attracted to them because of their beauty. And similarly, brothers and sisters, that when we're seeking, uh, when we're interacting with this dunya and we appreciate beautiful things from this world, we should try to appreciate that that beauty is coming from Allah subhanahu وتعالى تيسي صلوات على محمد وعلى محمد تيسي نظر صلوات على محمد وعلى محمد Tonight is the 14th night of the month of Muharram and on this night um, I would just like to mention a few words of remembrance about a very special person um, who is Sayyida Zainab Salamullahi Alaiha. Uh, Sayyida Zainab Salamullahi Alaiha, as we know, um, was the one who was in charge of the caravan of the Ahlul Bayt. 
the responsibility for this monumental mission is now in the hands of the sister of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And we're told in um, the history of, of Karbala that what happened is, is that before Imam Hussein alayhi salam um, is martyred, he has a conversation with his sister Zainab sallallahu alayhi And he, he advises her to be patient and he gives her um, the, the news that soon he will become shaheed. And then he has one thing that he wants to remind her of and to advise her to hold fast to. What is that one thing he wants to tell her? He tells her, Ya Ukhta, O my sister, La tansini fi nafilatil layl. O my sister Zainab, when you stand in the morning for your night prayer, don't forget your brother Hussein. We're told in a report that the daughter of Imam Hussein alayhi salam Fatima says that on the night after Ashura, I looked at my aunt and I saw her standing in the night prayer. She was weeping, tears were rolling down from her eyes as she was seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the same Zainab salam alayhi alayha, as she now has to travel from Karbala to Kufa, Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam says that I used to look at my aunt in the early morning hours, I would see that she would sometimes not be able to rise and stand for the night prayer. Instead, she would have to be sitting. I asked her, Oh my aunt, why is it that you do not stand for your night prayers and you are sitting? She tells him that, Oh my nephew, the reason is because when they give us food and water to drink, I sometimes give my portion to the children who are thirsty and hungry and asking for food and for water. So I have nothing for myself and I do not have the strength to rise in prayer in the morning. The same Zainab Salaamu Alaihi Alaiha. We see that when it comes to her entering the court of Kufa, there the people, well, how do they treat her? What is it that they say when they see the family of the Prophet? She sees that she and her sister see that they are looking at them and staring at them as if they are prisoners from some strange land who have been captured. Umm Kulthum tells them, O oh people of Kufa, do you not have any sense of shame before Allah and His Messenger that you look at the ladies of the Prophet as such? One of the ladies feels sorry for them. She feels pity for them. And she asks, who are they? And they say that we are the captives from the family of the Prophet. So they bring them dates and walnuts and charity and bread in order to feed them. But then Zainab alayha, throws away what they have given and says that we, the Ahlul Bayt, cannot accept charity from you. The same Zainab alayha, when she stands in front of the crowd, she addresses them and tells them that how could you do what you did? All praises due to Allah. Peace and blessings be upon my grandfather Muhammad and upon his righteous progeny. She addresses them and they don't know what to say. She talks to them. Her sister talks to them. And Fatima, the daughter of Hussein Islam, addresses them. At the end, the people of Kufa have tears in the eyes. And finally, it comes time for Imam Zainul Abidin salam to address them. What is it that Imam Zainul Abidin salam tells them? He says to them, Oh, I am the son of Hussein. I am Ali, the son of Hussein, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. I am the son of the man whose sanctity has been violated, whose wealth has been plundered, whose children have been, have been seized. Oh people, I plead to you in the name of Allah. Did you not write to my father and then you deceived him? May you be ruined for what you have committed against your own souls and for your corrupt views. Allah la'anatullahi ala al-qawm al-zalimeen wa sayyalamu al-ladhina zalamu ayyamu al-qalibin yanqalibun Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad